Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. The topic is Enterprise Architects Delivering Value in a Changing Ecosystem. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Gordon Barnett, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. I've had the pleasure of working with Gordon over the years through inquiry and research consumption. I really look forward to the topics to be presented today. I myself am Dan Hebda. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Mega International. I'll be interacting with Gordon throughout portions of the presentation, as well as following up with a conclusion. Gordon, over to you. Thank you very much. So good to meet everyone. It's always a pleasure to present uh, to the practitioners out there who are doing enterprise architecture. As you can see, the title is about delivering value in a ch changing ecosystem. So what we're going to focus on is how the EA role is changing because of the dynamics of uh, the, the business ecosystem. I'm going to focus on these three questions, really. What should EAs be focusing on now? Obviously, organizations have very different contexts. They have different drivers. So it's not always obvious when you talk generically about what are the key things that are getting EAs um, focused on modernizing and improving the performance of their organization. We'll then specifically focus on three key areas, and I'll give a, um, a reason why we chose those three areas. And this is about how EA can evolve itself and become more of a um, insights-driven type organization. And when you put all of that into place, we can really finish off with the last question. Okay, if that's all happening, what do EAs need to do with their skills and their practices? How must they really try and reimagine themselves? So the first area that I'm going to go on to is, as I've explained, what should EAs be focusing on? Now, every year, Forrester, just like many of the professional service companies and the other research organizations, do surveys. Over the years, we interview people, we do surveys, and we try and capture what is of interest to um, EAs any other function within IT, IT itself and the organization. What you see here is from our 2023 research. So you can see there's nearly 5,000 business and technology professionals that have provided input in here. We have a list of topics that we've captured throughout the year that we think are, are of interest. These are things that are driving the IT organization. And that's what you see on the left hand side. And what we ask organizations to do is selectively click the ones that are interest of interest to them. So when you look at the top, what you can actually see is improved security and privacy. 27% of that near 5,000 respondents said that improved security and privacy is one of the most important priorities. So obviously this is a multi-select click all that apply. That's why the totals don't add up to 100%. But if you look at this list, what you'll actually see is there's all the traditional things that IT have always been interested in. If you look at the second one down from the top, you can see improve IT reliability and resilience. IT has always done that. A bit further down, reduce IT costs. But there are three topics that I'm going to choose on this list, and I'll show them in a minute, which is where I think EA should be focusing. Not because they're the key priorities now, it's because they're going to be the key priorities for the future. Now, one area that's on here that I'm not going to focus on, as I think this is a conversation for a, another day, is about experience. If you actually look down this list, probably third one down, you can see the words customer experience. If you go a bit further down, you're going to see employee experience. A bit further down, you can see partner experience. Experience is a big topic. 
but it's too broad to have in this um, discussion that we're going to do today. So the areas that I would like to focus on are definitely security and privacy. The reason that I've chosen this is that the role of enterprise architecture in security is changing significantly. And I'll come on in more detail about what that means later. Another area I'd like to focus on is sustainability. Lots of organizations now are focused on sustainability reporting, whether it be emissions, carbon footprint, etc. EAs have a significant role. So what I'm actually going to do is show you how EAs can be involved um, in that area. Now, I'm not suggesting in security and sustainability that EA can be the leaders in this, but you have a big say, you can contribute and deliver value. The final area is, and I've got two bars here, but they're on the same topic, which is data. Now, nearly every organization today is becoming data driven particularly those organizations that are trying to be future fit and customer obsessed. You're going to use emerging technologies, your artificial intelligence, machine learning, LLP, all of these wonderful technologies to actually make sense of various types of data so that you can reposition your products and services so that you deliver more value and better experiences for your end users, whether they be customers, internal end users, partners, and so on. So the role of data is going to grow. Now you might ask why I chose those other than EA can have a, a role um, in supporting them. It's also because those areas are moving out of or have moved out of the IT world. So therefore, where EA may have been working with IT to look at these issues, it is now more of an ecosystem within your organization. So that's why we're going to um, focus on those areas. If you have any questions, obviously feel free to use the questions part on the live. And if I see questions that are relevant to what I'm talking about and I'm not going to answer them in the future, then um, I'll um, answer the questions as sees fit. So Dan, is there anything that you wanted to jump in that uh, at this point? No, I think I, I like the way you've framed it. And in particular, not only explaining what we will discuss today, but also some of the realms that we're not going to touch on. I'm eager to hear some of what you've discovered in the security, the sustainability and the data realms. So yeah, let's jump into the next section. Perfect. So this whole section now, which is really the meat of this presentation, is going to be on those three topics. And the first topic that I want to talk about is the role of EA in security. Now, for most of you, you may be in an organization that already has a chief information security officer. But there are lots of organizations who don't. Security might have been a function within IT. An EA had quite a significant role because in effect, you were doing a lot of what the CISO would have um, be doing if you had a CISO. So if you don't have a CISO, these are the types of things that would be expected of an enterprise architect. And really the chief architect may be the person that was actually doing this. So you were, were having a responsibility for identifying security risks. You were definitely coming up with, from a technology point of view, the security strategy. So you might not have been responsible for the security of buildings, the security of people, but you would have been for the technology landscape. You would certainly have been responsible for designing security architecture. Now, a lot of organizations did not necessarily have a security architect because this was a specialist um, role that sort of grew um, over the years. But in the security architecture, sometimes this was left specifically to the domain architects. 
So maybe a data architect would look after data security, application architect would look after the application security, and obviously infrastructure looking after the infrastructure security. You had to put controls in. You were always doing compliance. People were expecting you to be able to say that you were compliant with security policies. And particularly if there were uh, regulations from outside, they're relying on really IT to do this. And the first point of call would have been the chief architects in most organizations. And obviously you're expected to monitor that. So if we say that this is the base this is what enterprise architects role was. How does it really change when all of a sudden you have a CISO? And I'm quite sure that majority of you have noticed on whether it be LinkedIn jobs, Indeed, or anything like that, the number of organizations looking for a CISO is enormous. So the CISO role is very well um, wanted at the moment. There's a lot of people going for it. So the EA role will now not do everything that was on that previous slide. The EA role has changed. You are still important because CISOs will be looking high level policies, threat um, mitigation and things like that. They will be at the high level. They still won't be doing the lower level implementation, probably not even the monitoring and the architecture. So EA has a role. But if we think of EA, EA will definitely be the collaborator with the CISO. If EAs want to add value to any organization, to me, the two people they always have a relationship with are, are the CISO to mitigate risk and CFO to make sure that you're fi financially viable. If you've got those on your side, EA are always going to be in a good position. But collaboration is the key here. You've got to provide the technical expertise. Most CSOs will not be technical experts. They are going to be at the security level, policy threats, and all of that um, wonderful stuff. They will be relying on the architects to provide them with the technical expertise. They will not be doing the design. They will probably give you the, um, the security requirements. They might be doing this in the form of policies and directives, but they will be reliant on the enterprise architects for making sure that there's a design that meets their criteria and moving on to the next one that you ensure compliance. So you're still going to be um, participating in those rows. Now, when it comes to review security incidents, what I'm talking about here is not that you're a level one, level two, level three support type person for security. That is certainly not EA's role. Your operational and application people are going to be doing all of that. But what you as an architect are going to be doing is you are going to be looking for consistent weaknesses in the architecture. So if there are security incidents, what you want to do is look if this is a poor implementation, this is something new, or this is a weakness in the architecture. So you're looking at it through an architectural lens. And then there's a certain amount of um, oversight that you'll be doing. As more and more organizations grow their digital um, capabilities, and you just know that the hackers and people out there are always inventing new ways to break into organizations. The EA role is going to be more and more crucial when it comes to um, security. Now, another way to look at EA is not just to put everything on the chief architects or the enterprise architects. There are lots of organizations that are using frameworks like SAFE, where there is a distri distributed approach to architecture. So you'll hear, see some of their language here, and they talk about enterprise architects, solution architects, system architects. You've got to include the security architect there. So really, there are four roles now that are all covering um, security architecture. And this is where you start to look at your talent management strategies, your training 
and looking at the way that you govern because what you're now doing here is rather than having a single point making all the decisions you are actually empowering people to make certain security decisions so it's important to make sure that everybody's roles and responsibilities are well understood what decisions they can make what controls need to be in place so that you can ensure that governance is good and that you're managing the landscape well the, the icing on the cake is that you put transparency of communication in here every time you distribute governance and you empower people means that decisions are being made all over the place so therefore you must inform people so whereas you may have had an architecture review board before which does these sort of decisions usually the only people who know what's going on are the people who attend the arb in this new world you've got to have a communication strategy you've got to have transparency of decisions so everybody is aware of the new decisions that are being made so the next section that I'm actually going to move on to is the um, sustainability. But again, I just want to give a, an opportunity for Dan. Is there anything that comes to mind when you hear, hear all of this, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. I found the first slide of this section very interesting. In, in essence, you document some of the services that the EA practice could offer related to security to the organization. If there isn't a CISO, as your first section indicated, who typically would the enterprise architects or some of the other solution and security architects work with to deliver some of that value? Yeah, obviously, because you, you notice that we talked a lot about the, there's always collaboration. So the types of people that um, in a non CISO environment, Every organization has an audit or compliance type organization. So particularly for the regulation side. So obviously they're big people. The chief operating officer, if there is such a role in an organization, they're always um, looking for the efficient and day-to-day -day organization. And they're also looking at protecting the assets. And then the, the final thing is of always the uh, the CIO. I mean, I'm, we're talking here to an audience of chief architects, but we we have to recognize that the CIO is the main person when it comes to um, the IT environment. His head's on the or his her head is on the block. So therefore, uh, you need to collaborate with them as well. And then if I do have a CISO, uh, we've mentioned how architects can provide valuable information and work product to support their security work. Do you find that there's also information that is under the umbrella of the CISO that architects could benefit from? And are the security teams, the CISO, are they willing to share and collaborate? Or is it something that the architects are going to have to be a little aggressive with? No, I, I, I think it's very clear that the CISO are very open. It, it's interesting that the CISO does not accept empowered decision making like I've explained here. So there are certain decisions, the CISO's heads is on the block. So therefore, they're not going to let uh, other people make decisions. They want to make all of the decisions. But what they would expect is... A good example in the technology world is quite a few um, chief architects or enterprise architects linked to the National Vulnerability Database. So this is from NIST, and this shows you all of the vulnerabilities of applications and technology environments. That's the type of thing that a CISO and a chief architect would actually be collaborating on because what you need to know is which of those are relevant to the organization. It is the CISO who's going to make the decision about what is an acceptable risk. What do you accept? What do you mitigate? What do you ensure against all the usual uh, risk approaches that you have? But I don't think you're going to find that uh, there is no interaction. The CISO wants to be successful. The chief architect wants to be successful and they want to make each other uh, successful so they uh, there will be a lot of sharing of insights perfect i think uh, we can move to the next section uh, i could talk to you about security all day long so let's yeah. <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> yeah 
Right, so the next section is sustainability. And again, just like we, um, I showed the data at the beginning, this is from our recent survey, nearly 1,300 business and technology professionals. And it's just really looking at um, what are the actions that your organization is taking. Now, when I look at this information, it's all good stuff, but it's also, so what? Because if I look at that, I go, where's the technology? Where's the, the technology landscape? What actions are they taking in the technology um, environment? So the EAs who are fo uh, totally focused on the technology can also see what's happening. What you tend to find here is there's all the generic sustainability, climate change discussions about carbon footprint, waste, there's energy and things like that. There's not a lot that EAs can do in that space, but it's something that the organizations uh, focus heavily on. And you see all of these reports. Is it really helpful for you as an EA to know that China's a sustainability and carbon footprint is four times higher than America. Does it really help you to make decisions? Other aspects that you see in here, you'll see a lot of words on operations and you'll see things about the value change governance. These things are a bit more that can be investigated by the enterprise architect. You can say, fair enough, let's, let's dig deeper into each of these. So though this is a good information and you can see that there is similar to the first slide in 23% of people are saying, yeah, the action we're taking is reducing our carbon footprint. It doesn't tell us how they're doing it or what EA's role is. So from an EA's point of view, what I'd like to do is suggest that the first thing you should do is understand how your organization reports the sustainability. I think if you look at any of the business um, annual reports now, majority have been mandated that they must report on sustainability. And what you're actually seeing here are the types of measures and metrics that Forrester clients say that they're using. So obviously scope one, scope two, you're probably, um, for the, those of you who know um, sustainability, you will know that there are the three scopes that they talk about, but a lot of this is focused on emissions. That's the big topic. And then you can actually have a look at some of these others, energy usage. So from the EA, you're probably going to be working with um, the likes of your INO professionals, so infrastructure and operations, about maybe the en energy consumption of technology assets, maybe the data centers or something like that. So water consumption and stuff like that, maybe for the cooling and things like that. So many of these things are going to be out of scope for the EAs, but you have to understand this type of information. When I speak to enterprise architects, or something I've done with the, the EA vendors is said, well, let's take a step back. This is all really good stuff, but how can the EAs think differently? And the reason that I talk about that stepping back is because this is what I've heard through my interviews with you guys, the practitioners. So what I'm going to present to you is what other architects who are heavily involved in sustainability, what they do. And really, there's three areas that they focus on. So ignore the scope one, scope two, scope three. They think differently. So the very first thing they talk about is, well, how sustainable is our IT landscape? So this is all of the assets, the technology assets that you've got today. But don't just think of it in terms of, oh, I've got this asset and what is the energy, the emissions consumption, uh, everything like that about the assets. Let's look at asset through an asset life cycle. 
how does EA think about now the procurement process? Do we, as we get involved in procuring technology assets, do we now think of the green effects of the things that we buy? Are we already putting sustainability criteria into our procurement processes? Are we looking for partners where we can look at the assets that we buy and when we retire them or we dispose of them, we're conscious of the impact of the climate. So do we look at disposability? Are these all the new requirements? Does it change our IT strategy, our practices, etc., just so that we improve sustainability? So do you now start being very conscious of the third parties that you work with? So this is all about when you're doing your RFP and you're doing vendor selection, when you're doing partner selection. EAs can now look at that through just looking at the IT landscape, what you have today. And that may change all of your IT policies. It might change your architectural principles as well. The second thing to do is actually take a step back and think, well, what about all this emerging technology? Can we use emerging technology, stuff we do not have today that can give us better insights or can help us manage our IT landscape so that we are more sustainable in the future? So what you're looking at here goes back to looking at the investment choices that you make. So if I was to give you an example here, IT might be working in a logistics organization. Not a great deal on the transportation side that EA initially would think about. There's no technology there to a certain extent. But now you can think of IoT technology and various other types of um, data collection uh, technologies that would help you capture the emissions of transportation. You can look at the journeys of that, and then you can actually have a meaningful discussion about how technology has provided insights into your emissions. And now you can have a discussion about, well, how can we actually uh, reduce those emissions? Is there a better way of doing something? You can also see this with RFID and various other things that are used by the packaging organizations and the ship, shipping um, agencies. And the, the last thing that I think EAs can focus on is you want to be an adaptive learning organization. Many of the employees and your customers may not be focused on sustainability. Not through choice, it's just lack of awareness. So is there technology that you can use which is always providing educational insights to your employees and your customers so that they, again, help reduce the footprint. So you can think of things like having your lights, smart devices, which dim the lights in office buildings when there's no movement, where you have automatic shutdown of um, technology devices in that, again, just like you have screensavers and that to reduce the, the effort. It could be the same with your, um, if you were just something simple like a library that you, rather than someone go and switch off all of the uh, computers and that, you have something that can actually uh, shut them down. So the whole idea here is looking at it from an end user's point and how you can make them more aware of um, sustainability issues. So with that, I'll open up to you again, Dan. Is there anything that sort of whets your appetite? Here? Uh, sure. <laughs> so the first, uh, if for organizations that are doing architectural reviews, do you see them including any aspect of sustainability in those reviews or do you encourage it? Oh, we, we certainly encourage it, but it's new. Everybody's learning at the moment. And I think it's a case that one of the things that most EA practices are doing now is capability assessments. 
And what we've actually seen from our clients is when you look at the assessment of a capability, and particularly if you look at the infrastructure and the application lens of a capability, people are starting to put criteria in there on sustainability. So uh, I think when you think of the government um, bodies that have to follow FIF or uh, FIF or anything that comes from the, um, the the budgeting office, the GAO and all of that stuff, they're starting to put criteria in so that all government agencies have to do certain amounts of it. So it's definitely on the rise, but it's that it's infancy at the moment. And then you also mentioned disposable related to product selection, the procure procurement process, et cetera. Uh, how about also from maybe a software perspective, are you seeing more attention paid to winding down unused technologies, uh, not only when they're not in use for a temporary, but, but when they're permanently looking to be ended, are we making sure they've been removed from the environment? Is that something that the organizations and architects can help with? Yeah, and this is a significant growth area and I don't, it's interesting because I don't know what kicked this off. It's there, but we don't know what was the spike or the trigger that really caused this. But there is an enormous growth in discovery tools. This is not just discovery about your data and your uh, processes, which have obviously grown um, significantly over the years. But now you're having it at the device level, whether it be mobiles, your servers, your laptops and things like that. So all of these discovery um, tools are not only telling you what you have um, on these servers and that, but they're showing you the consumption and utilization of the software. And the whole idea is that, yes, people can then actually have a look at that. And it goes back to being data driven, that you're essentially using data to make more informed decisions about how you can help your organization meet their objectives. Or one of those objectives might be a sustainability. One last quick question here. Uh, if an organization has an entity that focuses on sustainability, a sustainability practice, maybe even a chief sustainability officer, do you find that the architects, similar to my CISO question, are the architects working with that group? Is there a willing collaboration? Are they aware of each other? Yeah, uh, I haven't seen that so much. I've, um, but that's because I don't follow uh, or I don't actually research whether there is such a thing as a chief sustainability officer. But what I will actually uh, tell you is that there is usually a committee of some sort. Now, the first point of call is always going to be the whoever the tech executive is, whether that's a CTO, CIO, but the EAs are providing input. So it's not unusual for the chief architect or the head of INO because they have a big stake in the game as well of actually uh, presenting to this committee on the that very first bit, how sustainable is our IT landscape? So it's collaborative, it's growing, but I can't answer the question on whether people have a chief sustainability officer, whether that will continue. Is that just a fad that people are going through because it's key at the moment? Or does it become cultural and that you actually have the discipline, not necessarily the role? So it might be a maturity thing. Perfect. Yeah, let's move on to the next section. Okay, so the last section that we're going to come on to is data. Now, the reason that I um, chose data is one, every organization is becoming data driven, but also data is now significantly outside of IT. It doesn't mean that schemas and data storage, data lakes, all this wonderful technology stuff isn't in IT, but all of the key decisions are usually made by an information uh, management group, data management group, or something like that, because data has been become a key asset for an organization, just like it's people. So human capital assets is a um, key asset for the organization. What you can actually see here is the focus on challenges. And you can see the types of things that they're looking at. 
having a vision for data, actually being able to manage data, how to get insights, the data science, the structuring of the data and the anal analytics of it. So they're looking across all of those. And I think the thing that was interesting is what's at the top. There is a concern about the maturity of technology. So that's why I think EAs can have a role. Now, I know during the whole of my conversation, I've talked about technology. I am not saying that EAs only focus on technology. So I think in Forrester's um, last research that we did probably at the beginning of the year, there's something like uh, 50 to 55% of EAs that are only focused on technology. There's probably another 40% that also do business architecture and technology architecture. And then there's uh, an, the more advanced group who focused on outcome-based architecture and things like that. So I'm focusing on technologies. I think this is at least 90% of the EAs have a vested interest in using technology to help um, advance the business. So what you're actually going to see here is just as with previous um, slides that had data on it, you'll look at this list and you go, yeah, these are all common. <laughs> We've had these years. So uh, I can look in the middle there and we see poor data quality, uh, lack of um, understanding the data, collaboration through the team, accessibility, readiness to data. There are big issues with data. And if you want to be a data-driven organization, you need to actually start focusing on this um, uh, more effectively. Um, and I think if you want to continuously use consumer or customer emotional data, their transactional data, your operational data, and make sense of it to help the organization, the architects have got to architect for that to happen. And you'll see quite a lot of him here down the bottom end, data silos and things like that. So should you have data silos? Should it be a different approach? But that's what you're going to have to decide when uh, you understand your business context. So the two bits I'm going to go into here is really just understanding it from an IT operations point of view, because I think the drive here is that this is a missed opportunity. Now, this report that's in Forrester, for the, those of you who are Forrester clients, you'll be able to read this. But when you actually look at IT operations, and I have many discussions with these organizations, when people talk about data, they're usually focused on the business value of data, looking at it from a customer and a transactional point of view. They very rarely look at it as operational data, how to improve and enable the IT organization. So I'd like to focus there so that you can see there's a four layered approach here. The number one foundation is principles. If there's anything that is going to change the EA role and the perception of data is through having well-defined operating principles. So we're not talking architectural principles, we're talking operating principles. And operating principles are really identifying the behavior you want today, the behavior you want to stop happening, and the reason why. So every good operating principle will be defined as we are going to do X as opposed to Y because we get benefit Z. That's how it works. If you have that, then you're going to uh, set up the foundation for uh, becoming more of a data-driven organization. Automation. Every organization going data-driven is looking at automation in the ability to understand, present, give recommendations based on data. If humans are doing it, it's gonna be slow. They might miss things. It's not that they're not competent, it's just their time factor. By the time you've made a decision, maybe the world's moved on and that data's no, no longer relevant. 
So embracing automation in the whole of the data ecosystem is crucial. Entertaining data science skills. I even had a chat very recently with an EA who was only just learning <laughs> how to do analysis of data in Excel. Others using R. There is an enormous um, opportunity here for enterprise architects that don't have to be data architects. You don't have to be data scientists, but you really do have to enhance your uh, data skills. You have to understand data and interpret data so that you can make recommendations. And then at the top, when you have those three, you will then become a data-driven organization. So what we will do is we'll say, well, how do you become this data-driven EA? So I've talked about the operating principles, but your operating principles build culture. So the very first thing you start with is culture. Then you build your data skills. Now you know how you want people to behave. You want to give them the tools, the policies, the practices so that everyone can um, act accordingly. You want to architect for success. So this is interesting because you hear lots of buzzwords when it comes to architecture because everybody wants to differentiate themselves. So all the consultancies will deliberately use different and vague terms to describe an architecture just so you think it's a new fad. But when you look at best practice architect for success, really your architecture should be able to enable change at speed. You must have an adaptive um, enterprise architecture, and that includes your data architecture. And when we talk about adaptive, what we're talking about is the ability to move your assets and resources to the point of need at the time of need. The best way to do that in today's world, if you want to do it at speed, is have it configurable. This is why you have networks now that are software enabled. It's about um, configuring things rather than actually build and replace. So we always used to talk about plug and play architecture as the way of moving. You now need to be able to really be configurable so you can scale up or scale down depending on the market circumstances in which you're operating. And then it leads to new dedicated roles. One of the things that we're seeing in talent management, and this impacts EAs more than um, anyone, is that you now need to have fungible skills and capabilities. The amount of technical gurus out there and experts is very limited. So if you want to maintain value within an organization, you need to make sure that your people that you work with have fungible skills so that they go back to this adaptiveness that you can actually move resources to the point of need at the time of need. So that's um, what I wanted to leave you with on data. Again, over to you, Dan, anything that springs to mind on the data side? So I know this is something uh, you like uh, focusing on. Sure. So for me, one of the questions that does come up often from architects we interact with, especially if we promote principles and culture change, there's a question of well, where do I start? How do I focus? Do you suggest something, for example, to look at the EA services they're already offering and how they can enhance them with data? Is there another best practice that you promote as it relates to where to start? How to make that even a more focused element? Yeah, sure. Now, there are an enormous amount of well-documented cultural change frameworks. I'm not going to go into that because they're all very good. They might come across as academic. So what I will do is I'll show you a, a, a few little things that um, I've gained from the practitioner world. 
So when it comes to culture, if you can think of a triangle where you have the three points of the triangle, at the top, if you put the word belief, at one end you put action and another area you put experience, that is really a simplified way of looking at culture. If somebody believes something, they will act accordingly and they will then experience something based on the way that they act. If that experience does not match the belief, they'll either change their belief or they'll change their, um, their action. And this is how you use operating principles to get a culture. Because what you want to do is the whole idea of the operating principle is to give the perception of a belief. So if I give you an example that um, we will protect all of our assets as opposed to we will build cost effective assets because we believe we will have a better um, corporate social responsibility, which will lead to um, trust with our customers and increased revenue. That's how you define an operating principle. You've now put in someone's mind that if you protect the assets, we're going to get all this revenue increase and happy customers. And what you've implied by saying as opposed is we're saying cost effectiveness is not the only factor anymore. We don't want you to just focus on cost. We want you to focus on protecting. So that's how you get a, a behavior. Now, if we put it in data, because you want people to think about data differently, just imagine that you've put these principles in place and because you've used modern technology like AI, maybe oh, the machine learning, the uh, predictive analysis, all of these wonderful tools, the insights that you get may be negative. We all hope that the insights are we're doing a wonderful job, but the insights may actually be negative. Nobody wants to hear negative. So if you have a principle that is actually telling you that we are going to focus on protecting our assets, that's implying that you're recognizing we're going to hear things that we don't want to hear so that we can take corrective action. If someone reports a negative insight and they experience negativity towards them, they're going to change their belief about the organization. They're not going to be data driven anymore. That the whole behavior is I'm not going to say anything that's bad. So you're changing the culture of the organization. And that's why operating principles are very important. That what you actually get there is um, you put it in people's minds that we're expecting good and bad, and we're not going to shoot the messenger. And when you get that success story that because Joe Bloggs told us that this was wrong, we did this action and now we've got success. And that's a success story that builds the culture of people willing to, to stand up and say, this is why we have a problem and they're standing forward. So that's what we mean by the culture. So I hope that answers uh, your question, Dan. Absolutely. I think it's a great transition too in the follow-up you've got related to skills. So I'm eager to hear more. Perfect. So what we're going to talk about now, this is a, a, only one slide before I hand over to Dan. But if I was to leave you with something, and this slide really says it all, from an EA's point of view, obviously nearly everything on this list is applicable to everything in your organization. But let's try and put an EA lens on it. Your talent management strategy you will hear a lot about employee experience. When we talk about a talent management strategy, 
think of e-harmony in your uh, organization on one side you've got the organization on the other side you've got your employees you want them to be a match and if the match is right what you're going to do is attract more employees who want to work for your organization so the way that i think about this is the organization wants work to be done to meet its objectives. So EA needs people to do the architectural um, purpose and mission that is relevant for your organization. On the other side, you've got all the employees who can do that work. Now, they have their own desires. They, they're they obviously going to be willing to do the work as they want to be worked, but they also want to be cared for. So what's in it for them? What are the other things that you can do for your employee that uh, for your employees that will make their life happier and they have a good experience with the organization? So it's not always pay and that might be career progression. Maybe you train them in other things so that they can go into the business and so on. So the whole idea of your talent management strategy is to think more of a human centered approach, not just a work based approach. So you've got to think differently. So when you're looking for people to get into your um, EA organization, if you're only focused on them doing EA work, you may find that they've got a short life lifespan because they can go somewhere else who offers them the eHarmony impact. The, the second one I think is a really important one. I, I talked about the number or the percentage of people who are technology focused and then there was the business architects. And then I talked a little bit about there's this last group, which are the more advanced who are outcome based, value based architecture people. The focus is on outcomes, not output. What you tend to find from many EAs is they do focus on the services. So this is terminology you just used, Dan, that, oh, I must produce a roadmap. I must produce a high level design, blah, a standard, a policy. That's all output. That's all good. You've got to produce outputs. But the reality is it's got to deliver an outcome. People who use those services have got to be able to achieve work. They've got to achieve their outcomes. So what you've got to do from an EA's perspective is use an outside-in approach. Understand what the person or the, the people you're communicating with, what are they trying to achieve? And then you can actually align your services and products to those outcomes with your value proposition. That's what's key here. Improve your experience literacy. I think this is crucial for um, the whole of enterprise architects. I said this was a uh, really a discussion in its own right. Most organizations are now becoming leaner. They are focusing on what is core to the organization and they're like assembly units. They're working with partners that are also bringing in products and services for the organization's customers. You've got to understand experience really through four lens. And this is my new research, which I'll come up um, with maybe on another day. You've got to understand customer experience. And when we say customer, it's the consumers of your products and services of your organization. You've then got your end user experience, the internal people that use your products and services. You've got your partners. These are people who um, you, you all, your organization also works with. So this can be something just like a consulting arm. It could be a research organization like Forrester. It could be a cloud service provider, etc. You need to have a good partner experience so the partners want to work with you. And then you've got the employee experience. People that are within your organization who just want a happy life and they see value in helping the organization achieve its objectives because the organization treats them with respect and as valuable. Financial literacy. Too many people focus on arbitrary things like technical debt and, oh, let's do an ROI on each product project what you really need to do on financial literacy is understand the cost of delivering 
value to a customer. You've got to have a whole architecture that supports the aggregate aggregation of all of these um, uh, financial factors that can help make decisions. Become a storyteller. Don't present outputs which are like a, a, a roadmap and expect everyone to understand it. Don't do it with an architectural network diagram. Be conscious of the audience and present what they will understand. And then finally, that the last one is on the business value. So, um, so hopefully, um, I've done a lot of that. I've probably taken up all of your time, man. <laughs> done. No, no worries. I think this section was clear. Let me uh, transition over to a conclusion, then we'll run through some questions. I think the presentation was excellent, Gordon. I appreciate the comment, uh, the data. It was, it was very valuable and actionable, which is, of course, what we look for uh, when we do the webinar. So appreciate that. And I will move a little bit up tempo just to try and respect everyone's time in terms of those in attendance and then leave a, a moment for questions. So Mega's response to some of the topics that were raised by Gordon, we refer to as next gen EA. And so what is the next gen architect? And so we touched on today the sustainability security data. There's, of course, many different issues that are facing uh, architects and businesses in general. And it re requires uh, that speed of change, the ability to deliver in new ways with all sorts of disruption. So as an architect, it's an interesting time. Uh, as a business, of course, it's a challenging time. Uh, and what we like to do is segment between traditional academic approaches where value wasn't the focal point. Gordon had mentioned that just at the end of the presentation. You've got to make sure that it really is about demonstrable value, outcome oriented. This is the way that the EA practices will succeed. And our mission at MEGA is to ensure that every EA practice is delivering undeniable value. And I put a caveat on that, that it's as recognized by stakeholders outside of EA that for the EA practice to genuinely be successful, it has to be validated by those who consume the value that they deliver. Uh, we talk a little bit about during the presentation, different perspectives and, and maybe buzzwords around what enterprise architecture is. And I like the notion that Gordon had about delivering what's needed when it's needed. I put that differently to aligning enterprise execution, the operating model by design to the company strategy. In effect, does your architecture practice help enable transformation as it's needed to move the organization in the right direction. And in doing so, you can come up with different EA services that you offer to your organization that need to be validated for the value that they offer. But a few examples of those services could be application rationalization, ensuring that the business, for example, has the right technology at the right time. It could get into elements of security, producing security architecture to ensure that the right levels of security are in place. Maybe it's elements around data to ensure that we can manage that data-driven approach, not only within the EA practice, but across the organization in total. But as long as the different services you offer, and we don't expect that every EA practice has a, a humongous set of these services, but that each one that you offer delivers measurable value from those outside of EA business, outcome-driven really is part of the key. And in line with that, we don't want you to get stuck. We do find that a lot of lower maturity EA practices, they will start with a portfolio management perspective, which is fantastic. It typically is low effort, high value. We recommend you do start there, but don't stay there. We want to help you go from there to other offerings like cloud related, or as we spoke to today, data security and or sustainability. How does Mega help us do that? Well, in order to support the next gen architect, we have the next gen platform. And in HopeX, we bring together different elements to accelerate that delivery of value, to ease the work of the architect, to ensure again, that the work product they produce has value by its consumption for those outside. Take you from discover through assess and to transform efficiently and effectively. And in particular, with some of our new capabilities around artificial intelligence and content providing to really move that rapidly, taking things that used to take years down to weeks so that you can get that value, not only eventually, but in a short duration and really succeed. 
Uh, last slide is around the organization of our vision is the platform is a connected platform and it does bring together different perspectives. You don't need to do all of them, but as you increase the scope of your EA practice, you benefit of the work from the other elements. You can see here integrated risk management, business process analysis, IT architecture and our portfolio management, data governance all on one platform fed by discovery data analyzed by artificial intelligence supported by industry content so that again, you can quickly deliver the value that you're looking to do. I'm going to switch back to the other screen, but any questions And I did just put a couple of bullets up on the side here to remind those of what some of the topics we spoke to today were, and that way it may jog your memory if there was a question you wanted to ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll look to what we have. I see one in the chat section that I'll go over to the formal questions, and it goes under the uh, data-driven culture. So I'll, I'll send this to you, Gordon. Uh, when we talk about that evolution, is it about navigating silos or removing silos? Yeah, this is always a, a difficult one. If um, I think the best way to look at this is if you look at an organization, if something is unique to a specific part of the organization, then it's a silo. That's not a bad thing. So I think the removing of silos is where it's common data and it, the uh, integration and accessibility of the data is difficult. So therefore you want to uh, remove them in that scenario. So. Great, I've got another question. The continuous learning and understanding, not necessarily hands-on experience of technology is becoming more critical. Does this imply that the line between enterprise business architect and enterprise technology architect is blurring? No, no it, it, quite the opposite to tell the truth. So one of the things um, Dan is more aware of than many of you on this call is one of the survey questions that we ask is what type of architects do you have in your organization? And many years ago, there were six types of architect, about data architect, application, all of the generic ones. You look now, there's close to 30 different types. There is a lower level of granularity because EA has been treated as a discipline that is collaborative across many parts of the organization all with their own expertise. So I wouldn't say business architecture is, um, and technology architecture is uh, joining that they, I think they're probably, uh, there's a wider gap now, but they work collect collaboratively together. Yeah, I would say that you might find even that there's more business awareness within the technology architect and more IT or technology awareness within the business architects. And that might be the aspect that would be a little less clear, but the function fully agreed. Uh, one last question. Uh, this is an individual who says their EA team is new to the EA field. Are there any ex exercises and or courses that the EA team must do to have the right level of skill? Any recommendations on maybe where to start their education? Yeah, again, this is always um, very, very hard. Generic architecture uh, courses are not really ideal. You need to have training which is relevant to your context. So if you were a cloud organization or you're going cloud, which most people are, and you just happen to choose AWS, then I'd find it really pointless going to do a Google Cloud course on uh, cloud architecture because their architecture is different to AWS. So I would go to AWS. So I think it's specific uh, training that you would go on. Yeah, I, I just want to echo that the business outcome orientation that we've spoken to, if you identify need within your organization as to where your EA practice is starting, then find training that supports the ambition of that first stage, so similar to Gordon's point. If you were on a particular cloud vendor, you might focus there. If it was another initiative, start the education in line with the delivery that you're looking to put forth. Great. That's all of the questions, and we are just a few minutes over time. I appreciate those who hung around for the Q&A, which is almost everyone. Thank you again, Gordon. Really, truly appreciate the presentation. Very insightful. And we look forward to having everyone join us again on a webinar. Of course, if there's any additional information, you can find us at www.mega.com. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.
Cheers. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.